Welcome to section three. In this chapter, we're going to talk about describing relationships between variables. So up until this point, we've talked about how to obtain descriptive statistics. But in this chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to go a step further and we're going to talk about how to get inferential statistics. Because most of the time, we're not just interested in our actual sample, but we're interested in taking that data that we have from our sample and making inferences over to the larger population. So that's what we're going to talk about first in this chapter. We're going to talk about the idea of inferential statistics and some of the aspects that go into being able to make those kinds of inferences. After that, the rest of the chapter is going to be spent talking about different statistical tests. So the first tests that we're going to talk about are going to be t-tests. And the idea behind t-tests is that you're going to have two variables. You're going to have your outcome variable, which is going to be a continuous variable, and you're going to have your predictor variable, which is going to be a categorical variable. So a t-test is going to allow you to look at differences between groups. So for example, we may be looking at the differences between females and males on income, for example. And so a t-test would allow you to see if there are significant differences among those groups. In order to visually assess that relationship, we're going to create two different kinds of graphs. And we're going to create an error bar chart and a bar chart with a mean. So those types of graphs are going to visually depict the, what we found with the actual t-test. From there, we're going to move on and talk about cross tabs and chi-square. This is another statistical test. And here you would end up using this test when you have two variables that are categorical. So for example, we may be looking at the relationship between gender and handedness, for example. And maybe we want to determine if one gender is more likely than the other to be right or left-handed. So in that case, we have two categorical variables and the cross tab and chi-square tests are the tests that we would end up using. Again, to visually depict that relationship between those variables, we're going to show you how to create a clustered bar chart. So we'll show that as well. Finally, we're going to talk about the type of test that you would use when you have two continuous variables. So here, for example, we may be looking at the relationship between SAT scores and first year college GPA. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to do correlations. Once we've done that, then we're going to conclude this chapter by talking about how to create a scatter plot so that you can visually assess the relationship between those two continuous variables. In this video, we're going to talk about inferential statistics. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about inferential statistics, and we're first going to start to talk about the importance of having well-defined research objectives. After that, we're going to talk about the different types of variables that you have. And what I mean by types of variables is that sometimes when you're doing your research, you could have what are called dependent and independent variables. So we'll talk about that as well. After that, we're going to talk about how the type of independent and dependent variable interacts with the concepts that we've talked about earlier of level of measurement that allow us to then determine which statistical tests, which statistical methods we can use. From there, we'll talk about why inferential statistics are different than descriptive statistics. So we'll talk about the differences between having data from your sample, which are really your descriptive statistics, and taking that information and then inferring those results over to a population. After that, we're going to talk about the idea of hypothesis testing, because a lot of times we may have uh, hypotheses that we want to test. So we can see, for example, the effectiveness of a new drug or the effectiveness of a new teaching method, et cetera. From there, we'll talk about probability because in statistics, we never know anything for certain because we're not working with the actual population. We're working with a sample. So again, we're going to spend some time talking about the concept of probability and how it relates to hypothesis testing. We'll also talk about significance level because again, we have to have a cutoff in terms of when something becomes actually statistically significant. So we'll talk about some of the issues there. And then finally, we'll talk about the outcomes. When you actually are able to find a statistically significant result, when you don't, what that could potentially mean. Let's begin by talking about research objectives. It's going to be really, really important that a research project begins with well-defined research objectives. 
Unfortunately, this is often overlooked. And this step is often overlooked or the research ob objectives are not well defined. And if you do not define or identify your specific objectives, then you might fail to collect the necessary information or ask the necessary questions in the correct form to end up with a data file that may not really have the correct information, the essential information that you need. So it's going to be essential that you state formally the aims of the research and your objectives right at the beginning. So then you can end up doing the subsequent stages and really end up analyzing the data and answering the question that you really wanted to answer. Now, there are different types of variables that you have in, in analysis or in a data set. Earlier, we talked about the idea of level of measurement where you have nominal, ordinal, and scale level variables. Well, that still applies, but those nominal, ordinal, and scale level variables, they can be two very different types of variables. In one case, they may end up being dependent variables. The dependent variable is also known as your outcome variable. And these are the variables that a lot of times you're going to wish to study and see how other variables impact these variables because these variables are dependent on other variables. The second type of variable are independent variables. A lot of times these variables are known as predictor variables. And you may want to see how independent variables influence or impact in a dependent variable. So let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, we're working for a pharmaceutical company and we've developed a new drug for depression. We want to see how this drug ends up impacting depression levels. What we have here is we have a simple research situation where our dependent variable is depression level and our independent variable is the type of drug administered. And so we want to see what the impact is of this drug on depression levels. So we're seeing the impact of our independent variable, our independent variable being drug type, on our dependent variable, which in this case would happen to be depression level. How does the idea of level of measurement and independent variables and dependent variables come together? Well, what you can see here is that, and as we've talked about, level of measurement of a variable is important because it determines the appropriate summary statistics, tables, and graphs that can describe the data. Now, statistics are available for variables at all levels of measurement. And in practice, the choice of method that you use, of statistical method that you use, depends on the questions you are interested in asking of the data and the nature of the measurements of the data. So this table suggests which statistical techniques are most appropriate based on the measurement level of the data of both your independent and dependent variables. And you can see that there are a variety of techniques and there are, believe me, there are many, many additional types of techniques. These are just some of them, some of the more common ones. And what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to talk about some of the more common techniques. So we're going to talk about cross tabs. And as you can see, you can do cross tabs when you have nominal independent and dependent variables or a nominal variable and in nominal dependent variable and an ordinal independent variable. So we'll talk about cross tabs. We're also going to talk about how to do a t-test. You can see what the situation is there where you have a scale level dependent variable and a nominal independent variable. And then we're also going to talk about how to do correlations. So uh, that situation would be where you have a scale level dependent variable and a scale level independent variable as well. So those are the three probably most common types of techniques, simple bivariate statistics that, uh, that we might up obtain. And there are certainly a lot of much more complex situations where we can incorporate many, many more variables. Now, ideally for any analysis, you would have data about everyone you wish to study. That is basically the, the whole population. In practice, you rarely have information about all the members of a population, and instead you collect information from a representative sample of the population. And we do this because we don't really have time to go and collect data from everybody in the population, nor do we have the funds. However, the goal is to make generalizations about the various characteristics of the population based on the known facts of the sample. So that's why you wanna make sure that your sample is representative of the population. 
Understanding how to make inferences from a sample to a population is the basis of inferential statistics. And this allows you to reach conclusions about a population without the need to study every single individual. Hypothesis testing allows researchers to develop hypotheses which are then assessed to determine the probability or likelihood of these findings. Whenever you wish to make an inference about a population from a sample, you must specify a hypothesis that you need to test. And it's the most common goal is to have two hypotheses. You have what's called the null hypothesis, and you also have what's called the research hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. At this point, we then have our two hypotheses, our null hypothesis, which is saying that there is no relationship between the variables, that there are no differences among the groups. And we have our research hypothesis, which says that we do have relationships between the variables, that there are differences among the groups. So when we run an actual statistical test, what we do is we always assess probability that the null hypothesis is correct. Before we talk about how to then assess these hypotheses, let's talk about the concept of probability. Descriptive statistics describe the data in the sample through the use of a number of summary procedures and statistics. Inferential statistics allow you to infer the results from the sample on which you have the data to the population which the sample represents. The fundamental issue with inferential statistical tests concerns whether any effects whether we're talking about relationships or differences among groups that you have found are real, genuine, or if they're the result of sampling variation, because the sample is not going to be exactly the same as the population. So as I said, you have two hypotheses, and you want to know which of these hypotheses is true. The way hypotheses are assessed is by calculating the probability or the likelihood of finding the result that we have found. A probability value is going to range from 0 to 1, corresponding to 0% to 100% in terms of percentages. And they can be defined as the mathematical likelihood of a given event occurring. You can use these values to assess whether the likelihood of any differences you have found are the results of random chance. When you're doing a statistical test, and it doesn't matter what tests you're doing, whether we're talking about a t-test or a, a chi-square test or a correlation or something more complex like linear regression or in ANOVA or something like that, we always have both hypotheses. We have a research hypothesis and the null hypothesis. And every one of those tests always assesses the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. That's the way statistics were developed. We're always assessing the probability of the null hypothesis being correct. Now, again, most of the time, we're not that interested in the null hypothesis. So we basically are trying to run this test to see if we can reject it. Now, when we do this, we have to set up some criterion. A lot of times we call it an alpha level. Most of the time, people use, traditionally, they use the 5% alpha level of 0.05. And people will say P equals 0.05. Probability is equal to 0.05. So it's basically indicating that if you run this statistical test and the probability of the null hypothesis being correct is really small, and that probability is less than 0.05, then we're saying that the likelihood of the null hypothesis being correct is so small, it's going to happen less than 5% of the time. Then at that point, we can reject the null hypothesis because the likelihood of it being correct is so small. So therefore, we have no choice but to accept the research hypothesis. Recall that when we are performing statistical tests, we are generally attempting to draw conclusions about the larger population based on information collected in the sample. And as you can see in this table, we have hypothetical situations for our population and hypothetical situations for the sample, what we're finding with the actual test. Now, let's say, for example, in the population, there are no differences between two groups. And in our sample, that's what we found. That would be a correct decision. Let's also pretend in another situation that in the population, there really is a difference between these two groups. And in our statistical tests, in our sample, we did find that there was a difference. 
That would also be a correct decision. But there are two major types of errors in this process. There are what could be false positives, or we could also call them type 1 errors. And they occur when no difference, no relationship exists in the population. You know, these groups are really the same. But the tests based on the sample indicate that there are significant differences, that there is a relationship. Now, how could that be? Well, remember when we're doing our statistical test, we have to set up a criterion, a cutoff value. A lot of times we use 0 0.05. What we're saying is that the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis is, look, if the probability of the null hypothesis being correct is really small, less than 0 0.05, we reject it because we say, eh, it's, it's highly unlikely that the null hypothesis is correct. But there's still a 5% chance that the null hypothesis is correct. That is your type 1 error. We're going to make that error, if we use 0 0.05, 5% of the time. If we use 0 0.01, 1% of the time. So this type of error is explicitly taken into account when performing your statistical test. Type 2 errors, or your false negatives, are mistakes in which there is a true effect in the population. So there's a difference between groups, a relationship among variables. But the sample test is not significant leading to the false conclusion that there is no effect. Basically, we didn't discover this effect. Now, the probability of making this type of error is often called beta. So your significance level a lot of times is called alpha. Type 2 errors are called beta. And whereas you can select your own alpha level, your own significance levels, beta levels are going to be dependent on things like your significant level, significance level that you set up initially, and the size of the sample. So how can you reduce the likelihood of having these type 2 errors? Well, for one, you want to make sure you have a larger sample size. By having a larger sample size, we end up getting much more precise estimates. And this allows us to be able to better assess our situation. And maybe we'll be able to detect differences that way.